If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Dude, what a fun little weekend uh, for us, or it was a week leading into the weekend with all these uh, spots that we stopped at, man, from Viore to Dosis to Mir. Man, I don't, I don't that was know. a great turnout, great event, man. Did that you guys have gone smoother? Did you guys have more fun at any of them uh, more than others, or is it like equally I the same? I thought this one was the more relaxing kind of chill the vibe that I like. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was great. It was awesome. Uh, Jeremy's a freaking awesome, awesome dude. Dude, how sm- for I was not expecting that. Yeah, I have. Well, to, he's a brilliant guy. Yeah, he's a really intelligent guy. Yeah, but okay, so. We all kind of knew that because he, we knew that he invented the, the the technology that you know creates the dosing in the in this and e cigarettes before that. Right. But I wasn't expecting him to have the personality that he had. Right. No. That was what was to ex- carry a conversation. Right. Because and you never know that sometimes when we get these interviews is like you know we our, our team is like courting their team and we're kind of finding out oh the different synergies in the companies and it's like okay cool the boys are going to meet and you know and I'm always excited to meet somebody. But there, you know, when when you're talking to someone who's like got an engineer mind, I'm thinking in my head like this guy's not going to be very cool. He's going to be very dry. There's going to be a lot of responsibility for us to carry this podcast. Make no, he's sure a it's super cool guy. Way cool. Way cool. Very knowledgeable and in the in the cannabis space. Which, not just ooh. the business, but the actual like science behind cannabis. And mm-hmm. you know, for 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 me personally, when I talk to other when I talk to other cannabis experts or whatever. Usually, many times I talk to them like, oh, well, you're not telling me anything I kind of don't know already because I dive so deep into that, into the science of it. But Jeremy did. He he went in pretty deep and, you know, Dosis utilizes terpene, the, the terpenes that are in cannabis and knows how to put those together. And actually, we talk about in this episode, he tells us how they figured out how to construct their, each of their pens, like the one that's for bliss or the one that's for arouse or the one that's for sleep or relief or whatever like why they work the way they do and how they figured out the formulas, which for me, because you guys know I'm, I'm, I love that that part of the you know of cannabis, I thought was absolutely fascinating. Well, oh, I think yeah. I think it's important to let our audience know too that this isn't like a this super plug because they're a sponsor. This is not a sponsor of ours. It's a relationship that we built. We obviously we can't uh, sp- be sponsored by a medical marijuana plan pen not yet at least you know yeah. mm-hmm. but it, we were so interested in the company and what the product they were providing that's where why taylor sought out the relationship mm-hmm. and then after meeting them i think we can all agree that we love it even more than what we did going into it oh right? dude absolutely I, I was not a big vape pen user of cannabis if i used cannabis it would be through the volcano or it would be a joint right if we're out or whatever but these dosis pens are the clean as hell, and they're super inconspicuous. Like you can be out in public, you're walking, going on a hike or whatever. You know, you don't want to necessarily pull out a joint. You know, depending on where you're at, right? But these dosis pens, you do it, and it's like doesn't smell, works real well. Good stuff. No, yeah. I really liked it. I appreciate it because it's like it, it, they're trying to kind of take away that whole stigma of, of what you know marijuana has had for just decades and you know that's a big hill to climb and i just appreciate the effort that they put into their products and you you see it already like even with my wife it's like she she looks at that because um you know that's still there like that stigma is still around but it's like it's less it's like oh no this this can be a medical experience yeah, yeah. Th- this was a really interesting conversation i'm excited to hear the feedback from others that listen to it because it, it surprised the hell out of me i'm i'm really excited to to release it to everybody and then get feedback and then we, i've already got, started to get feedback from people that either one already knew about the company they're like oh my god they're awesome or people that have ran out now and tried the product out since they've seen us already posting about it so really interested to see what you guys think now we do because it's not a sponsor we don't have any sponsors for this episode who's, who's going to sponsor us right. <laughs> are, like uh, should we our own shit i mean actually we, i think we should sponsor uh, the, our, we yeah. should sponsor our own episode when this right show here. airs you think you only have like three days left to take advantage of the, the oh promo. there you go sal yeah th- this month uh we're giving away the inter- the intuitive nutrition guide and the fasting guide for free with the enrollment of any of our maps bundles or fitness bundles now, these bundles are where we take multiple MAPS programs, we put them together, and we discount them like 30% off. The most popular one is the Cadillac of bundles, the Super Bundle, 
which includes Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, Maps Aesthetic, Maps Prime, and Maps Anywhere. So you get all those programs, and it's a year. It's a full year planned out for you. So you follow one program to the next for the entire year with workout blueprints, videos where we're demoing them, uh, different types of adaptation, different exercises, rep ranges, like your body progresses the entire time. Enroll in that bundle or any of our other bundles and you get the intuitive nutrition guide and the fasting guide for free. And you can find those at mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to Jeremy. He's the COO of Dosist. Jeremy, we, we wanted to turn the mics on right away because I hate when we talk outside when people we like the people to hear us getting to know you at the same time so yeah, I think absolutely. It's, it's more authentic and, and real that we way. waste all the good stuff if we don't so I was already asking the girls some questions before you got here and I was just curious how long have you been in the the cannabis space yeah so I've been in the cannabis space for about five years um, I come from the electronics business so my entire background is making printed circuit boards for all kind of different consumer and industrial electronics, right? So everything from the GPS controller that's on a Caterpillar gen set to um, LED lighting as it first started getting popular. And a lot of that's done in Shenzhen, China, which okay. is a, uh, you know, an area, an area in China that's really focused on manual electronics labor. Um, so a lot of your lithium ion battery driven products come out of there. A lot of your printed circuit board stuff comes out of there. And in about say 2011 into 2011, but in 2012, electronic cigarettes started getting popular. Um, we kind of, me and my, me and my business partners based out of Chicago, been out here for about three years, but we started tinkering around with electronic cigarettes because one of our engineer's cousins was selling 40,000 of these really cheap, like poorly made electronic cigarettes uh, every month into bodegas just in the Midwest around Chicago, right? Oh, wow. First started getting popular, super cool thing. Problem was about 40% of them failed out of the box. Mm -hmm. So we start taking this thing apart, you know, being engineers and making, inventing stuff, looking at ways to make things better. We start taking it apart, looking at it and going, this is made basically as cheaply as you could make something, right? It was back in the day, if you remember how LED lights were, they used to be super expensive, really bright, no color to them, right? Those right. were all made in the same facilities. And as Sony and Philips and GE and all the big companies started making their own LED lights, all of these LED lighting factories started switching over to e mm. you know, whether it was the regular kind of standard e you see that looked like a cigarette or, you know, as box mods started to get popular, you know, guys vaping and blowing big clouds on the corner and stuff like that. Um, and we made one simple change to it, right? We took what is a flexible circuit and something that is inside, you know, Apple watches and Nike flex bands and things like that. A lot of really higher end consumer electronics. And it was something that we made for on contract for a company that was the, we made it as the up and down volume button in Boeing airplanes. So underneath your armrest, a little up down, cool. you know, aircraft, okay. aircraft quality stuff rather than it being you know, rather than being a bunch of wires that are soldered together, mm. they use a flex circuit, right? Got Reduces it. failure points. So we decided, we decided to say, hey, okay, let's take all the wires out of this e-cig. Let's put a flex circuit on it. And that was kind of the first step. Uh, and for a few years, we made electronic cigarettes. Got, you know, I don't want to say we got lucky around 2013, but had a little bit of foresight to to say, why, why wouldn't you take this electronic cigarette and actually dose the same exact amount every time? So we put our patents in for dosage control. Now, were for, you at that time? Are you thinking about tobacco or is cannabis? all all tobacco? Right, because so, at that time, really nobody was even making cannabis vapes. Right? right, you had a lot of people making their own oil. Some of them putting them to bigger box mods, but you mostly had people, you know, at that time doing wax and shatter and things right. like that, and in wax pens or or nails or torches and things like that. Um, the technology really is rapidly advanced when it comes to making oil. Um, so at that time it was really all around electronic cigarettes, but you know, our thought was, why wouldn't you want to dose that? You mm -hmm. know, so we started making dosage control products and created a couple of really unique dosage control products, but figured out that, well, the stuff we're making is a little bit too high end to meet the margins and the amount of money that, you know, you actually need to produce this thing for to sell it at the 7-Eleven or a Sitco or sure. or something like that, right? That people are buying for four, five, six bucks. So it's pretty sophisticated for what it is, right? Yeah. 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 I mean it's it's 
the the e-cigarette was invented a long time ago, you know, and there, there's one guy that's really attributed to have invented it at this time. Big big tobaccos bought most of their patents, by most of this guy's patents up. But um, you know, it's a it it was a simple, very very simple platform <laughs> that we kind of just tried to make a little bit better. Um, we did in the e-cigarette business started working with big tobacco companies, thinking, okay, we'll offer dosage control, try to license the, pr- the product into that. And, you know, me and, me and my business partner, both relatively young guys and weren't really, weren't really looking to just license our technology out. Um, and then in around 2014, one of my buddies was in town from Colorado, stayed at my loft for Lollapalooza, had this big kitchen that I never used, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And said, hey, I want to make some edibles so that I can go to Lollapalooza and, and sell them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, ended up taking some of the oil that he had, putting it in one of our basic e-cig designs that we made and said, hey, this thing works great compared to everything that's else that's on the market oh, right now. Oh, shit, like right out the gates. Even, right not even the, designed for it. Not even designed <laughs> for it, right? And really, that's what that's what most early vapes are. If you guys, I know a couple of you guys I from would, the cannabis I industry, seen, right? I've seen the very first three models that ever yeah. existed. So and it was that standard product, single siphon wick coming yeah, up. It was terrible. Made of plastic. It, was, it made a mess. It worked <laughs> yeah. a few times. Yeah, it would like, leak all over the place. Yeah. And, it, you know, it would start clogging and the oil starts coming into your mouth. I mean, not a not an ideal experience, but because it was such a more, you know, because it was such a more discreet way to consume yeah. cannabis, mm-hmm. people, it took, people took to it, right? right? I mean, even then people are like, hey, I'm at the restaurant in the middle, you know, I'm hitting my vape pen at the restaurant. It doesn't make these huge clouds of smoke like a, like an e-cigarette does. And it doesn't have the smell that, you know, smoking a joint does. Right. right? So it became, you know, really a discretion play. Yeah. And, and that's kind of, I think what initially led to the pot, the rise in the popularity of it, because mm-hmm. any, anything that you buy, if 25 or 30% of them break, that product's probably not going to make it yeah. for too long. It's right? a huge opportunity too yeah. for someone to enter the market and just create something that doesn't break. Yeah. Now, now are you say. seeing that when your buddy's getting, he's making all the edibles, you throw it in the vape pen. Now, right away, are you like, aha, like we got to do this for cannabis? Or yeah, was it- so it was like this. He's like, can I take 5,000 of them? And in the and we were like, <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, cool. Because in the e-cig business, it's like we're pumping out hundreds of thousands of these all things right. every week, right? And we're like, sure, take whatever out of the, you know, out of the warehouse. They're not branded. They don't have stickers on them or anything yet. Um, and the aha moment was when he called back a week later and he's like, Shut Hey, can you, fuck up. can you, you give through- me like, can you give me like 25,000 of these things? And we're oh, like, Oh shit. He went through 5,000 that fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's Cause insane. They, Cause they worked. Right. I mean, they didn't leak. They weren't purpose built. It's not the way we, we build products now for cannabis, but it was already a better e cig right, than what right. was on the market, you know? So as soon as he said that, you know, we kind of take a step back and go uh, 25,000. And we were like, yeah, we don't even know what, what do people charge for these things? And then we hear the price that people are charging for this, for a cannabis product, you know, 10 times more margin for us. And we're like, okay, well maybe there's something to this, to this <laughs> thing, right? So maybe we'll now, it. what are you, what are your thoughts at this time in your life about cannabis in general? Are you already somebody who uses? Or are you somebody who's not really into? Yeah, it? so I was uh, more of more of a CBD consumer, right? Um, played sports my whole life. A um, couple of bad accidents and injuries. Uh, one on a motorcycle, you know, and went through what a lot of people go through when they do that, right? L four, L five fusion, herniated discs in my neck doctors prescribing opiates and opiates and opiates, right? Mm-hmm. So started actually using more CBD and ratioed products, right? One-to-ones, higher CBD products to kind of wean myself off of that, right? Mm-hmm. Because that was, you know, if you don't know, right? And you, you have that kind of injury and you go to the doctor and, you know, then I'm working 18 hours a day, running an electronics business, trying to grow my business. And, and on opiates my f- are nasty. Yeah. yeah, opiates Look, are nasty. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, they're necessary, right? Mm-hmm. You, you've got a traumatic injury, you're in some serious, severe pain. But what ends up happening is over time, you either you know the doctors have you keep coming to take them, mm-hmm. and it becomes a cycle, right? And over time, your body gets used to it. You need more and more, and there's just at some point where it's a, it's an untenable situation, right? Mm-hmm. Over time, you know you you either have to find a way to stop or you're going to be on them for the rest of your life right. and the downsides and the side effects and the way that it affects your life 
are, you know, extremely negative, mm. you know? So there's definitely a place for them. It's just not in long-term holistic care for your body. No, actually. they're already showing um, in, in states that where the cannabis laws are looser, where it's either medicinally legal or recreationally legal, opiate use drops every single time in all of these states. People are finding that it's a, it's a great uh, replacement for opiates, and it's obviously the addictive properties aren't the same. It doesn't cause the same withdrawal and all that other stuff, which may be why there's a lot of pushback. You know, I can only imagine. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, get, getting into a one of the hardest parts around the lack of federal legalization and the lack of federal funding that we have here is you can't go you can't go to bat against the FDA and big pharma, mm -hmm. you know, in these things. It's just there's too much business, it's too much revenue. And frankly, the doctors, while many many of the doctors who understand cannabis would love to be able to prescribe it, if not as a replacement, at least as something that helps supplement supplement it, right? Because right. there are a lot of studies, like you're mentioning, that show the decrease. A lot of that decrease is because if you do need, look, there's there are people that have a need for opiates, right? Cannabis, in some some circumstances, with very very acute pain, cannot completely replace it. But they've shown that if you combine the use of cannabis with an opiate, you can decrease by 50 to 75% that consumption, right? right and right. then you're decreasing the side mm -hmm. effects. You're decreasing the long-term detriment to the mm -hmm. body. Now, now, were you worried when you entered into the cannabis market of the... Because I know the tobacco market's definitely got its own hurdles and red tape and all that stuff, but it's got a pale in comparison to the cannabis market, right? Because it's still federally illegal or at least it's still a you know scheduled drug according to the federal government were you a little apprehensive going into that market yeah you know personally we weren't right so um it wasn't it, it wasn't something that that scared us off one of the interesting things and i think that people don't uh people don't realize this because they think you know tobacco is so regulated and and you know the fda gets involved in advertising and the testing of tobacco and everything like that those those same types of regulations have not crossed over to the e-cigarette space. So mm. there's literally no regulation about what the product is made of, you know, what components are even inside for, of it. Even for e-cigarettes? Even for e-cigarettes. No shit, wow. I didn't yeah. know that. So I've you, seen some independent reports on some of those uh, e-cigs, and they're seeing all kinds of shit in the, when, you know. Gnarly. Yeah, like gnarly worse for stuff. you than a, than a cigarette So sometimes. So even yeah. when, you know, we, you know, we were used to, you know, we were really custom designers or custom electronics designers. Um, but when we looked at making something to quality, I was even starting to ask, okay, well, in an e-cig, they used to just put stickers around the outside. And I was like, okay, well, what ink is being used on that sticker? And none of it's food grade, <laughs> right? And then I'm asking about the plastic. What plastic are you guys using for these mouthpieces? None of them are food grade. What's what's the coating that's on, you know, the very common that you see now, the nickel plated, they, like, people like to up? call them stainless steel, but it's really just a nickel plated silver tip that's on a lot mm -hmm. of the cannabis. Mm -hmm. Like that's not safe. None of that is food grade, right? It's not safe to be in your mouth, but just whether it's for the bacteria and everything that could potentially. Yeah. I mean, it's just what it's made of, right? The process, what, what the plastic's actually made of, what can stay on there, you know, anodizing very cool looking. You see climbing gears anodized. A lot mm. of pens are anodized, but anodizing isn't technically food grade, mm. you know? So just because it's got so many pits in it, there's, you know, when you get, don't want to get too technical on the electronic side of stuff, right? But yeah, but that's really interesting. Yeah. I had no idea that the e-cigarette market was different than just the cigarette market. Like yeah. that they can, they would actually have different laws and regulation. I think it would be the same. I just assume that. Yeah. It's a yeah. gray market. It was a kind of a gray market, right? Because nobody, it, they didn't regulate it because it didn't exist. And then when they got invented, then regulations seem tend to follow. Yeah, yeah. but it's been, it's been around for a long time now. It has been around for a long time, but big tobacco didn't really enter until about 2016. So mm. a lot of times regulation comes from companies wanting to push out their competition. Of right? course. So there was, a, uh, there was a thing on the table in 2016 uh, and in technically in August of 2016, there's this thing called the PMTA, which is a pre-market tobacco application, which says any product that wasn't in market by 2016 for e-cigarettes technically would need to meet this PMTA requirement. Mm. All that is, is no competition for us. a million dollars of testing for every SKU. 
Now, who can afford to do that? That's right. Big Tobacco yeah. can afford to do that. But, you know, all the guys that are making all of this vape liquid and guys that are making, you know, mm-hmm. smaller players. I'm so glad you're saying They can't this. afford to do that. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Like, that's how, that's how most of the regulations in the market exist is from big players trying to eliminate or competition or raise the barrier to entry so high that yeah. there is no competition. Yeah. So if I'm, a, you know, if I'm, if I'm Philip Morris uh, or, or RJ Reynolds and I want to put out 50 SKUs, different sk- individual SKUs. So, you know, five different products, 10 different flavors. What's 50 million to me? Right. Nothing, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm an e-liquid manufacturer and I've got 50 flavors, I can't afford, to, you know, you can't afford <laughs> to, to do that. It, you know, so... Yeah, you're right. It's it's a barrier. It's a, it becomes a barrier to entry, and a lot of times the regulations get pushed as a barrier to mm-hmm. entry. And I'd say that you know when you asked earlier about being scared off about going into the cannabis industry, it was actually more attractive, right? Mm-hmm. Because we saw it coming. We were working with Big Tobacco as we saw them developing dosage control, and we're talking about our dosage control technology with them, and you saw them. Buying patents, buying patents, buying patents, right? And so, so the They're writing, their bets, huh? the writing was on the wall. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, we're one of the very few people in the cannabis industry that actually has our factory, controls our factory. We have people that work there full time in Shenzhen, and we started to see a consolidation in the factories, right? So, whereas in 2015 there was, you know, 1,200 or so e-cig factories out there pumping out a wide variety of products, right? I mean, there's there's box mods, there's vapes, there's, you know, the small ones, there's different types of cartridges. Across the board, there's a lot of different styles of electronic cigarettes. But what happened is they started to, Big Tobacco bought the good ones, started buying the small ones and shutting them down. You know, two years later, you had 400. And now 2018, there's you know, maybe 50, 55 mm. real factories wow. over there now. And most of them are controlled by big tobacco. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's become a really interesting landscape. And what a lot of people don't see is how, you know, it's the, the cannabis vaporization technology has come a long way since, since yeah. we first saw it, right. Yeah. It was just, Hey, I'm going to buy this e-cigarette tank off of Alibaba. I'm going to put my, you know, natural CO2 oil in it. You know, it used to be brown amber basically mm-hmm. and everything not the gold distillate you see today and um and i'm gonna and i'm gonna sell that right and they failed a lot too but just like e-cigarettes that were failing it was cool it was something different it was discreet it was easy mm-hmm. to use especially for somebody who doesn't you know want to smoke cannabis or smoke a joint or a blunt or whatever right yeah. so mm-hmm. um you, you know the technology has gotten better but for the most part um, the brands today are just buying a standard white labeled product that they buy from one of, you know, about 15 different companies that make, that make e-cigarette vapes for cannabis. And, uh, they can get their name printed on it differently or get a different color tip put on it, but you pretty much see the same style yeah, across yeah. the board. Now, right? how do you guys, now, how do you guys handle quality control on the back end, like with the flower and stuff? Because like when I was in the space, you know, it, it's, you get it was you had to go to five different farmers just to keep stuff on your shelf. So I can't imagine the the amount of pens that you guys have to fill, like and getting it into the space as late as you did. How do, how do you deal with that? How do you? Yeah. So you know, luckily because I'd been making private label vapes for a, a lot of the big companies over this time, you know, I started to understand the relationship. You know, so after, um, you know, after we get this second big order and go, wait a minute, there's something to this. I started spending all of my time going from Chicago to Denver to Seattle to Portland to San Francisco and to LA and kind of just making this loop around the places that were actually doing some volume in oil manufacturing and pers- you need, you and need, learning. You right? need to look into that. Like I need that. to learn, right? From an engineering perspective, I'm look I'm looking for process. I'm like, okay, how does this happen? So that how are people making oil so that I can make a device that works better? Right, because even then, we're we as we started making products specifically for cannabis, changing the wick, changing the coil, changing the materials a little bit. You know, we were seeing different failure rates from different people, and you know, we know that we are we're a GMP certified ISO certified manufacturing facility. So we know that if we quality control it coming out there, if I make a hundred thousand of something, it's pretty much exactly the same thing every time. Right, mm-hmm. so. 
if we start getting, hey, one person says this one's leaking, then some of them are clogging, what's really going on? You know, so started learning the oil production process. How exactly are people making oil and how wide is the vari- variability of what people are putting inside of this? Yeah, and we're, we've really just, I mean, it's only been maybe the last year or two have we've evolved it to where it's this pure, clear, clear yep. stuff. Just like you were saying before, it was just amber and yellow and it was, you know, maybe... 90% at best pure is some of the best stuff if you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. If you were lucky. And, mm-hmm. and one of the biggest things was the, the particulate matter that was yeah. left in there. Right. So that amber color is just plant material. It's floating around in mm-hmm. this liquid, you know? So if you're looking to try to vaporize something that's got to go through a saturation screen is going into a wick, right. It starts clogging up, yeah. it, you know, so learning about the oil process allowed us to start making better pens, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the oil inside that we were trying to deliver, you know, we need, we got to customize the hardware specifically for that material. Now, did you, did you, did you guys contract that work? So the reason why I'm fascinated by this and I'm asking these questions, I feel like we're going to end up running into people that we know because I mean, the, the machinery that it takes to produce a, a high enough volume to fill thousands and thousands of pens, there's only a handful of people that own that machinery yeah. and some of them are related to me. And so it's it's like, how did you guys build that all out yourself or did you guys go find people that were already mass producing and then you guys contract the work? Yeah, so we yeah, definitely, we started, we started building custom filling machines for cannabis um, and we were working with, we've worked with a number of different companies, people from the aerospace industry that handle thick liquids like, um, you know, epoxies that are, that are coating linings on airplane parts and stuff like that. Um, to try to find a really high quality because believe it or not until probably 2017, even the people that were putting out a hundred thousand pens, they were doing it by hand. Oh shit. Yes. I mean, you literally had guys with syringes filling these things by hand. So you can't measure exactly how much is going in there, kind of eyeballing it, you know, and most, most filling machines are, are used to dealing with products that are like, um, you know, pharmaceutical grade, right? This thing's filling essential oils into a bottle. That essential oil is exactly the same every time. Mm-hmm. Cannabis, cannabis oil is a really, really interesting thing to work with. And it's very hard to work with because it's very thick. And um, just because of the nature of the oil, very small temperature ranges affect the viscosity greatly, mm. right? So I have a question because uh, one of the big issues that the medical community has had with the inhalation of cannabis, or at least what they say their, their big issue is, is the difficulty in measuring the active ingredient with a hit. You know, obviously different flowers, uh, you know, different types of flower are going to have different percentages of cannabinoids and terpenes and all the other uh, active, uh, you know, active ingredients, but in particular the cannabinoids. Then of course, how hard you hit the joint or how hard you breathe it in how the person, you know, if they're if they're if they're used to doing it, if they've done it before, if they've never done it before, so like you could have somebody take a hit of a joint and get, you know, half of a, a you know a, a milligram of THC, and another guy can get five milligrams of THC. So that was a big problem. How did you guys? How does this pen work to where every hit is the exact same amount every single time? It's a reservoir, right? Isn't that what happens? Yeah. So I mean, it really starts from you know, the entire process, uh, you know, the finished form is what is the simplest way that we can provide a consistent, repeatable experience to a consumer, whether they're a consumer that's been in the industry for a long time, but especially people who are, uh, who want or are curious about cannabis and want to use it, or have had this past prior bad experience, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. either with an edible product or a joint that was way stronger the second time than the first time they had <laughs> right. it, you know, those kind of things. So, and, and with flour, it's incredibly hard to get specificity, right? There's tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of different strains right now. And every one of those strains has different phenotypes within, within it. And the way that the amount of, cannabinoids and and very importantly the type of terpenes and the terpene profile are going to be significantly different based on where it's grown so even if i have the same exact clone right a lot of some people grow from seed 
most large growers grow from clones, which are basically cuts off of the same exact plant mm-hmm. so they can get some consistency. Well, if I take that clone and I grow it indoor here in LA, where there's a lot of there's a lot of big indoor grow, and then I take it up to Carpinteria, where there's a ton of greenhouse grow, right? Or I go up to Humboldt County and grow it outdoors, the end product is completely oh, different, different yep. Yep. right? And not to mention that, you know, we've put strain names on things like OG Kush. Ev- there's probably no no less than 50,000 different types of OG Kush out there, <laughs> yeah. right. right? The it doesn't original mean much plant, brand name, it doesn't yeah. mean a lot anymore, right? Because people are taking different they cuts. bastardized and, the hell out of it. Yeah, they have. And I mean, it's not, it, it, you know, I don't... N- I don't think nobody's done it on purpose and it's not a negative thing, but we're not in the Monsanto era where this is a genetically engineered seed and everybody is using that exact same thing to grow their corn. Right. right? I mean, this is, these are things that have been passed around that Mm -hmm. have been protected that, you know, that guys have in seed banks and stuff. So it's a, you know, the variability at the plant side and then growing that plant and what conditions you grow it in. I mean that the, cannabinoid level the terpene level right. is always going to be different so right. yeah because this is exact i mean you you when you when you look at the box of one of these like i'm holding the, the bliss i look on the back here and it'll tell me you know how much per dose uh, I've, of thc cbd of you know the different types of terpenes it actually breaks down the terpenes which by the way i think you guys these are the first people i've ever seen to list that i don't think anybody else talks about terpenes or tells you what kind of terpenes are in their product so, I mean, that's fascinating, and especially when, as cannabis starts to go mainstream, or if, you know, as we move forward towards, you know, legalization nationwide, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a joint with bud called, you know, Girl Scout cookies or, you know, Purple Kush Crunch or whatever, it's going to be much more difficult. But something like this, I could see this being, you know, way in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Look, it, the, the product was built to provide permissions for people to feel comfortable trying cannabis, right? So... So how do you how do you stay as true to the plant as possible, but deliver an experience that people are used to, right? Like you know, the goal of the company is if I'm in Los Angeles or in San Francisco or Chicago, New York, Miami, Toronto, London, yeah. over time, right? Um, how do I know that I'm going to get the same exact experience? When I was in college, people were passing a joint around. Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm just going to hit it and see what happens, right? Now, because cannabis is so strong and there's so many different trades, like <laughs> I'm not going to just like just grabbing a joint from someone. I I have a hundred questions, yeah. you, you know, be before, crying in the corner. <laughs> so you may be, you know, <laughs> I might, happened to me. I might be super paranoid and energetic, or I may have to lay down on the couch at this party, <laughs> yeah. right? And and you know, and people will say, "Oh yeah, this is you know, this is Blue Dream," maybe. Maybe yeah, exactly. it, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? <laughs> so how do you go from this variability in the plant to delivering a specific experience? So do you guys have machinery that tests it where it hits each pan and tells you the amounts of cannabinoids in each hit or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of walk kind of walking through the process from start to finish, right? You take the flower, mm-hmm. um, you take we use THC and C B D in all of our products. Um, we take that through a primary extraction process, which is CO2 is what we use. There's okay. a number of different things you can you. use. Okay. You can use ethanol, you can use CO2, you can use a hydrocarbon. Now CO2 is supposed to be the best one to use. Why is that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, a lot of, a lot of definitions of best, right? Okay. Um, CO2 is not as volatile as like a hydrocarbon extraction is, mm-hmm. you know, hydrocarbon extraction has gotten a really bad rap for a few reasons. Number one, People just used to open flame blasts. Oh, but we were blowing butane yeah, in it fucking yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. And and so yeah. that was a problem. People, you know, there was safety issues around that. Mm. The machinery now has gotten so much better and the rooms are built to yeah. tremendous fire codes, mm. right? What about for the user? Is he is it safer to use an extract that's that's using it like CO2 versus Well now they're they're getting the, where they're at to the point now where they can they can process it all the way down to where it's ninety nine point nine percent pure. I mean you're Yeah, so so you're what used to happen that, is, yeah, is what used to happen is the guys would blast that, right? And then they wouldn't do the necessary post-processing to actually get all of that oh. butane and propane and hexane out of the product. Mm-hmm. So not only are you, is it super dangerous as they're making it, you've also got 
like you might be Toxic. inhaling now, hydro, hydro now you're com- technically hydro I, I would imagine there, right? some of your competitors are still doing that to this day there's no regulation around that is there it's getting it's getting better so until until december of 20 until the end of december of 2017 there was no required pesticide testing or residual solvent testing in the state of California, other than in Palm Springs, the city of Palm Springs and the city of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the commitments that we made with the company very early was to say, we are going to test our products to the most comprehensive regulations that are out there at the time. So we used the Oregon health, health, health standards. Um, And we are not going to ever put a product that has pesticides in it. And we will test for residual solvents, mold and microbiological materials and every product that we put out will pass. Um, these don't; these are dummies, so they don't have the analysis sticker on them. But if you buy a Dosis product at the store and you look at the actual lab sticker, there's a batch number on there. You okay. can go right onto our website, punch that batch number in, and it will pull up the lab report. That's dope. And that's from now all the way going back to the first pen that we put out, right? So even in a time where there wasn't a set regulation within the state, we complied with the strictest standards that we could based on what the labs were able to do. Now, starting starting now in 2018 with adult use legalization, now there are lab re- testing requirements. You are allowed to put on your boxes that you're not testing to compliance at this time, but uh, it looks like July 1st will be the compliance date. Oh, wow. Where yeah. there's going to be a full 58 panel pesticide test yeah. and you can't have residual solvents. And so when we say residual solvents, that's the butane is there butane hexane or propane in there also is there ethanol isopropyl alcohol a lot of the stuff that we use in post-processing to clean up the material okay um and then when it comes to the plant so if you you know a joint is there mold and microbiologicals in there what's your estimation on how much is that going to affect the market like how many people do you think is going to get carved off because of that so it's going to be significant right mm-hmm. yeah like how um, so, like what do you think come on well, how are they going to well i know this i know he, how are they going to check it, on them that's the thing like just because it's legalized well, doesn't mean they don't have people going around or do they no they do now so um as of of, as of July 1st, you have to, if you're a distributor, right? Basically, they've used the distribution piece of the business as the lever for regulation. So if you're a distributor, which Dosis, we distribute our own product. Mm-hmm. So we have a distribution license. We're responsible to take that product into a compliance cage. The uh, One of the compliant labs comes in and sends someone in. They pull a percentage of product based on the batch size take it back, a finished good, totally in the pen, filled everything. They will have to cut the top off the pen, pull the oil out of it, and they'll do the testing. Mm. If it if it passes, now that can be distributed to the store. So that's not to say that there's still not a lot of non-compliant business going on, right? You've got hundreds of illegal dispensaries in LA alone. Um, what you have even more of is illegal delivery services, and those are still out there. But, you know, for you know, for the, for the bigger brands and the, the people that are building strong core businesses, trying to, trying to serve the consumer, you know, compliance is getting a lot better. Um, look, the state has a lot to do, right? I mean, you're basically, you're basically trying to build regulation for a 20 billion, what's going to be a $20 billion industry just in California over the next couple of years. They're going to overregulate in a year. I, I think. No, they'll, I think right? they'll overregulate. I, I, to be honest with you, I think. When do gonna, we never not overregulate? Yeah, I know. <laughs> when, is, when do we ever not overregulate? They're going over to overregulate and overtax. The, the reason why it's taking this long is because the government wants their fucking money yeah. anyway. Well, <laughs> uh, they've been monitoring all this shit so they can go yeah. in and grab their well, shit. Well, that's now, a, that, that's what I mean. They're this is where over- I want to know. Like, have, so part of why I left was because I I just got tired of waiting. Yeah. I got tired of waiting. For, I was part of the front wave of people that were trying to do when we first opened. Right, so we were two of the first four cannabis clubs in San Jose in the Bay Area. So before us, there wasn't really anybody else. And LA was doing it first. And at that time, they only had like 10, 15 clubs. And my partners and I, when we came down, we looked at, we went, walked in and right away, because there's, there was, we partnered up with guys that were in the, the gray black market side of the business, because back then that's all there was, right? And we're coming in on the front end, medical marijuana is coming we go down south and we start checking these dispensaries out and my my two partners i'm going like oh my god like this is going to go in a space where 
you know, some 70 year old woman with arthritis needs it or someone that's got gut issues wants it. And they're a lawyer, a doctor, a, a wife, a, a mother, like normal people. And everywhere you walk in, it's shady as fuck. There's a huge 300 pound muscled out steroid guy with a gun in his back pocket. You, I mean, just you could smell the weed like I mean, it was just so unprofessional that we, we looked at it and go, oh, man, this is going to be so easy. Like, we're going to come in and do this right. And we did. But it, what was so frustrating for us trying to, to build this business legitimately way back then was all the other buddy undercut and all that. There was no regulation. There was nothing that stopped you from backdoor selling or doing selling other drugs or whatever yeah. it took to through. Because at that time, it was all these hustlers and drug dealers. There was very few guys like yourself that were in the space. And guys like me got tired of waiting. So do you, did you go through this frustrating? Are you still going through this? Look, look it's it's definitely not as it's not as bad as it used to be. Um, there's you know there's a lot more infrastructure. There's still not near enough infrastructure to support it. Um, but there's there's still a lot of that same hesitance from ninety percent of the people to go to a dispensary. Mm -hmm. Like even the nice dispensary still have a dude in a bulletproof vest with a yeah. Glock yeah. standing out front and you're going through a security. Now I get it, right? It's, you know, dispensaries, especially back in the day when there wasn't, you know, there wasn't more focus on how, yeah, they, how were much all you were robbing, they were all robbing each yeah, other. I mean, people were getting robbed all the time, <laughs> right. right? So it was actually dangerous, but still one of the, you know, one of the things that we try to push and I, you know, I support very heavily and work with the, the Bureau of Cannabis Control here is why are we legitimizing a business, but still not allowing it to bank? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why should, why should I have to, when it's time to pay excise taxes, have to have five armored guards and an entire truck to bring $2 million in cash to the department of finance. Right. Right. And, why is we get you know it, it, the most le from the most legitimate company to the most illegitimate company bank accounts shut down all the time yeah. right i mean it's just if it's not an illegal business let's figure out a way to structure it so that you don't ha so you take cash out of the equation right the most dangerous part of the business is not like what do you i mean how much how much pot flour can you possibly go steal to make it <laughs> worth it, right? Yeah. I mean, you, if you go steal extract, maybe it's worth it, but what do you do with it at that point, right? But right. the everybody knows that cannabis people have money. They have cash sitting around because you can't bank it. Yeah, right. The irony is all those regulations make it more dangerous, create black markets. If they overtax the hell out of it, the black market's going to be- That's what happened to us. We watched when we, so we were before even the taxing really started to happen. And then it was like, all here this comes so we're getting hit sales tax store tax the city tax the state tax. Yeah. before you knew it like i was like i gotta sell an eighth at like eighty dollars just so i could pay the staff and we can keep 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 things on the shelf yeah it but was, the dude across the street can sell it for 40 that's right because he's, he's not paying any of those taxes right, exactly he's cashing and out. that's still a very real circumstance for the dispensaries in la that's I would, what i that's what i, I thought that's, I, I would like to point out though that you guys quality control you guys have put together a product that all before regulations it just it just highlights how markets work you guys want to be the best and you guys are out competing everybody as a result and this is before any regulations well because pe people want quality that's right, right? i mean they, and it's they, in your best interest they do want quality <laughs> and it's in your best interest we still feel that like even even though we've grown to be a significant market share um in the business it wasn't really a core, it wasn't really a great environment for us to grow during that time. Mm. But I think what it proved was that people were looking for a product like this. Mm. And even today where we've got amazing dispensary partners like MedMen and uh, Kaliva and Airfield and the Apothecarium groups up north, to just to name a few of our of our great accounts that really run great businesses. Shout out to Airfield. That's our, yeah, that's our dispensary. That's our uh, nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Pat. What's up, man? <laughs> um all of the, all of those guys still, it's really hard to get our core consumer into that store, right? Mm -hmm. We feel that there's still 90% of the people, even in a market like California, that's relatively hip there's to the cannabis business. Yeah. Exists, I mean, right? look, you're, when it comes down to it, your Manhattan beach mom, it's not going to go to a dispensary, even if it's a nice one. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, hope there's there's things around e-commerce that are going to start to change that, right? And as that as that develops more and more, and different styles of dispensaries and more welcoming environments. You know, mm -hmm. look when when 
when a lot of people started rushing into the cannabis business, I hate to use the word green rush because it's such a played out term, <laughs> yeah. right? But when, when people started rushing in, they were like, oh man, this cannabis business is so much different than every business. Margins are awesome. Regulations are relatively light. You can make a bunch of money. And they overpaid for their leases. They thought that cannabis was always going to be this huge margin business, that it wasn't going to market correct. Like, you know, business is business over time. Everything market corrects, right? So you have to put out a good, consistent quality product. Thank you. At yep. a at, at a at a at a price that is reflective of the quality, right? Mm. There's great vapes that are thirty dollars. There's great vapes that are a hundred dollars. You know, there's you know, they may be two completely different things, but they serve different markets. But regardless, over time you got to run your business like a business, absolutely, right? And that, I think that's where a lot. So I think that's why you're going to continue to see this shift towards more you know, retail markets and, and retail locations that start to reflect like, you know, an Apple store, mm -hmm. a Sage natural wellness store, a Warby Parker store, you know, those kind of things. It's so, it's so funny too, because the more they get out of the way, the faster the market for any product, but in terms for cannabis progresses. I remember, I remember going up to, where did I go up to Oregon when it was legalized there? What would it still just medicinally legal in California? So in Oregon, it was it had been legalized for a lot longer, fully, right, recreationally. And I went into the store, and I could the quality of the cannabis, the packaging, the labeling, was already better because there was they opened the they opened the gates a little bit, and and people competed. And when people compete, you're going to get more efficiency, you're going to get better products because consumers are going to demand it. And I, I remember seeing the difference. I'm like, holy shit, California used to be the leader. Now I'm seeing. Stuff over here, but now of course California's catching up. Yeah, and it's I mean, and, and now you have products like yours, which mm -hmm. looks like I mean, yeah, they look awesome. I was going to ask you about uh, you know the decision making process in the design of it because I know that you know you're trying to make it more. Justin said it like a tampon when he first yeah. walked in. Yeah, no. <laughs> I said yeah. I'm going to tell him you fucking said that, dude. I said what? I'm sure he did it out on purpose. Like it's Actually, I think I, I think tampon. I think uh, fucking, yeah. I think medical. This I think guy. like. <laughs> and I say if I can sell as many dose pens as tampons are sold. <laughs> You know, one of my, fun, one of my favorite ones is uh, in the Atlantic, they wrote an article and the, the, the woman that wrote it used the, the term space tampon. <laughs> like, that's pretty good. I mean, that's my favorite one so far. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't take, uh, I can't take any credit for the beauty of the packaging and the, the, the way that it was presented. It was an idea that we partnered with, um, there's original co-founders of the company. Um, there's a company called Anomaly, who is our partner in the business. Um, Anomaly was named last year's uh, 2017 Ad Ages Agency of the Year. Mm. So everybody from Budweiser, Beats by Dre, Dick Sporting Goods, an mm. incredibly long list. They have offices here on Abbott Kinney, but offices in six countries. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 two founders, two of the co-founders of that company are on our board of directors and one is the chairman. So we were fortunate to have a, you know, to have a, a firm that has created some of the best marketing campaigns in the world. If you remember the Budweiser commercial with the horses and the little yeah, puppy chasing yeah. them, that's well, such you a know, significant that's, that's difference. Our, you can tell right yeah. away too. Yeah. The, the thought process that went into the cleanliness of the design and it looks like something that could live on the shelf, you know, at any sort of retail. Yeah. And, 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 and that was the point. And when, and when you're looking in the cannabis industry, see, I think a lot of people, uh, it, it gets echo chambery when you're just talking to people in the cannabis industry because we know THC and CBD and indica and sativa. Like we just you know these things because you're because you're in the industry, mm -hmm. right? But even being in the industry, I've I walk into a lot of dispensaries and it's just wildly overwhelming, right? There's just like hundreds of products mm -hmm. on the shelves mm -hmm. and the merchandising is crazy and you don't can't really even tell what they are. Mm -hmm. So when we when you know, the need states, the need state concept was actually the core of the business, right? How do you, how do you, how do you go back 5,000 years, right? And, and read all of the literature and look at everything that people have consumed cannabis for over this time. You, you know, it's not, and it's, and it's very well documented, you know, people consuming, people using the leaves or the, 
the seeds from the cannabis plant and putting them on hot coals as women are giving them labor to re- or going into labor to relax them, right? I mean, people using it for anxiety. This is thousands of years ago, by the way. Thousands of yeah, years ago. Yeah. So we looked at what are all of these, what, going back 5,000 years, what are the things that people utilize cannabis for? And let's try to deliver that, mm. right? Let's deliver not, you know, not the... The, the cannabis culture, while it's been an amazing culture and it's given people, it's given a great rise to the medical access side, which has been super important, right? Even in most medical states, like you wouldn't call California the last 20 years a medical state, even though it's been amazing for the access for people that really needed cannabis as a medicine. But the problem is it's the other it's the 10% that you really see that is the ripping bongs, huge giant blunts, mm-hmm. you know, the that that entire subculture of the cannabis industry is what was more visible to the rest of the world, mm-hmm. right? Not the not the not the kid with seizures no. that needed it, not yeah. the person with cancer that needed it for pain relief. So when we looked at it, we said, okay, let's take away the let's take away the 10,000 strain names. Let's take away that super edgy stigma and let's go, what do people actually use it for over time? You guys did for cannabis what we did for fitness. This (laughs) this is like fitness has gotten ridiculous with all these different exercises and movements. And there's some shit that's been we've been doing for a very long time that's very functional and works. And that's really how we built all of our programming because there's something in that. And I think that. People overcomplicate it. You look on 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 Instagram now, and you go through all the exercises. You see someone doing some weird shit. It's some weird ass movement and exercise. It's like, yeah. dude, we've been doing movements for hundreds of years, and people yeah. are thinking that this is going to be the next great yeah. thing that's going to make my triceps look a certain way. I feel the same way in cannabis. Well, is- even besides that, it's it's. I, I we I must have said this five ten years ago. I, I I know I said this on our podcast many times. If you want to, if you want your industry to be legitimized. Don't name your shit, you know, you know, uh, crunch berry, whatever, and don't make gummy bears with 50 milligrams of THC. Like for sure, some kid is going to get that and get their hands on it, or at least it looks like it, right? Like, th- like they had to in order to be legitimized, and it be, it's psychoactive. You know what I mean? Take it, out, take all the kid stuff out, the candy stuff, and the weird names. Make it look like it's a legitimate, you know, product because it is. You know, it's a plant that does some incredible things for a lot of people. Sure, you could use it recreationally, and that's fine too. But I mean, treat it like adults are going to use it, not like you know, kids and, and maniacs are going to use it. Yeah, and and you're look, <laughs> you're absolutely right. the The gummy candy, all of that thing. When you talk about dosage in cannabis, <sighs> like. I, you know, my business partner talks about this time where when we were talking about dosage control in cannabis, somebody gave him a chump chunk of a, like a little tiny chunk of a chocolate chip cookie. And it was immobile for eight hours. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and afterwards, a guy who's a guy we know is like, oh man, I, you know, I accidentally put four times, messed up the calculation and I put four times more THC in there than I thought, you know. <laughs> and they made, they made a cookie. There was a yeah. cookie in, in, in San Jose, a thousand milligrams of THC. Yeah. A thousand. If, for people who are listening who have no idea what that means, a, a dose that most people will feel is between two to five milligrams. I'm cool with five milligrams. Yeah. More than five milligrams for me, and I'm too spot. high. Now, heavy users that I know may do, may do as high as 15, 20 milligrams. Definitely don't recommend that if you're a beginner at all. You'll probably have a bad time. A thousand milligrams in a cookie? It's what the hell? Is yeah, it's you're what, trying to see you if you can kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. and and insane. and one of the getting back dimension. to the quality control side of it, right? Right. There was no, you know, most of the products weren't tested, right. and it's not like these things are being made in the same factory that's making the um, Nordic Naturals gummy vitamin. Right. Right. right? These are being made in like a dude's kitchen. And now they're getting better, right? But sure. for a long time, because of the because of the you know the legalization, mm-hmm. if you're even if you were really trying to run a business, how are you going to cap? How are you going to capitalize and capex into a million dollars in equipment 
if you don't even know if you're going to have a license next year. Right, yeah. right. You know? Right. Yeah, and, if you, there's no capital because the, the risk is too high. Yeah, it's, it's su- super high risk. So you don't have, like, you don't, you don't even have the, the equipment's definitely getting there now. I mean, look, there's some beautiful facilities here. And as you go into the other states where the people's licensing's a lot more structured, mm-hmm. you're starting to get some very nice GMP quality facilities. So, you, you know, it's definitely moving rapidly towards higher quality, but still... It, you know, the, the, the thought that more is better doesn't necessarily apply to cannabis either, right? Um, we've tried to move out of this price per milligram conversation, right? Like, I don't, I don't buy alcohol based on 90 price proof. per proof. Yeah, we right? <laughs> go for moonshine, uh, right? Yeah, yeah like, yeah, yeah I'm, you know, every, or everybody would buy Everclear, right? right? And, th- and that's not a great experience. So, so when we looked at it, we said, let's take, let's take the milligrams out of it. We're putting, we're very well documenting exactly how many milligrams are in there, but even more than that, how many doses you're getting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have our dose pen 200, which was, was our original pen. The price of all of the things that we do, which is, test our material four times, ensure that it's the cleanest possible thing there, build a pen that has a full microprocessor inside of it that controls the temperature of vaporization, controls the timing, is built of all medical grade plastic and all medical grade components inside in a real GMP environment, right? And is packaged in a way that actually gives you instructions and makes sense, right? And tries to lead you down the path of here's what you should choose, mm-hmm. you know? And so going from that, going from that need state concept, that is, here's an idea. Not, not all of these are strictly medicinal, right? We call the, we call them need states, but when we really have it broken up into experience states and need states, because that glass of wine after work for someone that needs to relax that's a need. That's a, that's a body need a lot of times, right? Sometimes you need to unwind. So the bliss pen, even though it is, you know, it's a, it's strong, right? It's a, it's got a, it's got a high amount of THC in it, It gives you a good amount of energy. Um, It will intoxicate you if you, if you continue to consume it, but, um, but it's there to give you that exact right amount. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, And that blissful experience is a need state that your body needs sometimes. Right. Sleep, calm, and relief are much more in that medical, medically focused, specific area, and then passion and arouse, which are which are a product that we launched, are you know sexual health is a definite need state, right? That's something that people need. Um, and when we look at those pens, we talk about you know there's a lot of a lot of interesting. I like to say it's get in the mood, stay in the mood. You know we have we have one of our one of our reps who says pregame and game you know, <laughs> for it as we're oh, explaining yeah. it around. But you know the aroused pen, especially in a, a place like we're sitting now, Venice, that's an incredibly incredibly creative community. You know the aroused pen is one of the most popular products here because it's inhibition lowering. It's still energetic and it enhances creativity, mm. right? So we get we we see people using the products a lot, but the core of it is you can control the experience to the point where, hey, if this is something where I like to use one one dose of bliss before I go out or two doses of bliss, I know how I'm going to feel mm-hmm. when I'm doing it. And there's no smell when you use them. I mean, there's you guys have definitely... Uh, I don't know anybody that comes close to what you guys are doing. There's no competition in this particular sense. And the what I really appreciate is the information that you guys provide. These booklets back here, I don't know what they're called, the field guides? Oh, yeah. I think they're called? Yeah. That's the first uh, time I've seen anybody put together something as comprehensive that talks very about well presented. that talks about the different cannabinoids or the two major ones that uh, that, you know, uh, have the most studies, THC and CBD. But then also talk about terpenes and their effects. I've, it's been very hard for me to find information that, that I wanted to ask you because I've had, I know quite a bit, I, I've had my own personal experience with cannabis. I had a family member um, who had cancer years ago, and so I went super deep into research. And so I've learned quite a bit on the cannabinoids, but there wasn't much on the terpenes. And I know for myself, because I also use cannabis, when I could use one strain that's got you know 18% THC and 2%. CBD and I can use another strain with the same exact CBD THC, but one makes me anxious and I get anxiety or paranoid. The other one feels really good and calm or whatever. And it's not always the CBD THC. There's other things in the plant that are obviously 
making me feel different. And I and I think it's part of it's the terpenes. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about some of the terpenes because you guys actually list the terpenes in your vape pens, which is awesome. Yes, the the terpenes are the least talked about, least understood portion of the plant. The term strain is the most influenced. Now, there are other things. We get into minor cannabinoids later, but strains are primarily influenced by the terpenes that are in them, right? So um, basically, terpenes are the components of essential oils. You know, they're found in... They're found in basically every plant, every fruit so it gives them the that smell, you're ever right? going to see. Yeah, they're, they're flavor and fragrance, but more than anything, they're effect driven, right? So why does why does why, why is lavender used for relaxation and sleeping? Mm-hmm. Right? Why are citrus scents and minty scents, things like peppermint, used for uplifting? It's got to do with the terpenes that are inside of those plants as well. So cannabis is one of the plants that has the heaviest terpene profiles of almost any plant that's out there. And it's got an incredibly complex terpene profile. So most cannabis plants, you'll, if you, if you take them to, you know, to a real hardcore GMP lab that has the best equipment, they'll see between 45 and 95 different terpenes. A lot of them that can't even really be identified, right? Wow. Um, so what we did was rather than saying, okay, we're going to make, we're going to make a strain, you know, I'm going to Jack Herrera is a super popular product for energy, (laughs) right? I have a funny relationship with Herrera. (laughs) That's the the strain I I smoked when I came up with our first program. Yeah. Yeah, That's one of the most creative strains I've ever had. Yeah. It's great. Super energetic, right? So instead of saying Jack Herrera, you know, we say bliss, but we didn't, we didn't take Jack Herrera and profile it. So we took a database of about 6,000 strains from labs and looked at the terpene profiles of all of them and then grouped them into the, which I don't like to use the word anecdotal mm. um, when talking about the, 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 the evidence behind cannabis, sure. but because it's not scientific or consumer, or, you mm. know, clinical trial, I'll use the anecdote. I'll use the word anecdotal. Yeah, but if we also consider when you have enough anecdote, when you have thousands and thousands, or tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of anecdote, I mean that's evidence, and, yes. and that and that drives research nowadays. In fact, a lot of the medicine, like uh, the like uh, the medicinal use of CBD for epilepsy, was driven by anecdote. Thankfully, the internet existed, and lots of people got together and said, "Hey, this is stopping my my pet seizures, my kid seizures." So. Yeah. Yeah. So we took, so I'll just use Bliss as one example, right? So Bliss, we wanted an uplifting, energetic product. So we took the strains that people generally consume for those. Jack Herrera is probably the best example. There's a lot of, there's a lot in in that family though. Jack Herrera, Lemon Jack, all of those, that entire Mm -hmm. family of strains, people love as an energetic, non-paranoia inducing sativa, Right. right? right? So then we took six or seven of those strains and layered out the terpene profiles and said, what are the terpene profiles of all of these strains? Brilliant. Okay. And then built custom terpene profiles based off of the primary components in these strains. And we built about, we built four different ones for each need state Mm. and then did consumer tests and said, okay, so here is our bliss A, B, C, and D. And we had, a second set where we varied the THC and CBD ratio, right, of each one of those. Because mm-hmm. all of our products are CBD attenuated. We don't have anything that's just THC or just CBD. Excellent. Which, which you Excellent. know, we can get in a lot bigger conversation around why in the oh, endocannabinoid I, system. Oh, but, I, read a, I read an interesting study where, it, where they took people who uh, did heavy THC and then people who did heavy THC with CBD. The potential, the side effects, the negatives that, that are associated with cannabis way lower when they combine it with CBD. Way significantly lower. lower. Yeah. So so we took that and we built our own terpene profiles, our own formulas, our own strains effectively based on the consumer feedback that we got from these different terpene profiles. And the the primary consistency around the product is in that 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 terpene profile is exactly the same every time. So your flavor and your effect is going to be the same every single time with the product. All of our products are 88% cannabinoid oils. That ratio is going to vary between THC and CBD oil Mm -hmm. and 12% terpenes. And that terpene profile is exactly the same every time. We list on the box the top five 
most of our profiles have between 12 and 20, where all of them have between 12 and 20 different terpenes in them. Um, and, you know, just like, it's just like grabbing a can of Coca-Cola or going to a Starbucks, right? You want to have consistency in the product, but the terpenes are really what drive the efficacy. So, um, it's when, that big of a deal. It's the whole deal. That's right? so crazy. So, so because, uh, so take the oil, for example, right? We, we make THC distillate mm -hmm. and we make CBD distillate. Now we do grow specific strains because of how they grow, how fast they grow, how they yield sure. and what minor cannabinoids are in them. But when it comes down to it, the distillation process, which is what you see as clear or gold now, mm -hmm. you have removed the strain from the product. It's just CBD time, and THC. Right? I mean, it's there. there's a little bit of extra particulate matter in there, but mm -hmm. let's say for our product, for this specific product, we distill our THC to 87%. So it's 87% THC. There's going to be some small portions of other minor cannabinoids in there, CBD, CBG, CBN. Um, and then and then the rest of it is just some plant matter that's mm -hmm. still remaining, giving it that gold color, right? We can continue to distill it farther if we want to, but the way we've created our formulations and the ratios that we try to hit between THC and CBD, that just happens to be the number that works, works well for us, right? Mm -hmm. And then we combine that exact terpene formula. So if you took all of our blends and you took, you, if you took the, so the bliss and the sleep, bliss is a nine to one THC to CBD, sleeps an eight to one THC to CBD. By themselves as distillate, very little difference. You wouldn't notice the, the difference. It's a percentage point on each side right. when it's THC and CBD. However, that 12% terpene blend is what makes this one give you your Jack Herrera inspiration. And this one give you your, you know, you, you know your, your, we don't like to call it drowsy because we try to avoid a drowsy experience, but give you that restfulness. Mm. Right. And if we flip flop them and we put the bliss terpenes in that sleep formula and put the sleep terpenes in that bliss formula, this would just be a stronger sleep formula. And yeah. this would be a little bit lower THC bliss formula. Right. right? right. So it's that exact, it's that exact exacting terpene profile that oh, that's really brilliant. Nobody's that really doing that. Drives. Well, so a lot of people are doing it, but they're I usually, haven't seen it. They're usually just so most of the pens, most of the vape cartridges that you see that say uh, Jack Herrera on them, sure. right? If you go and you buy a standard 510 threaded vape cartridge, it's pretty much built the same way as this. They're just making their terpene profile based off of a Jack Herrera flower right. and throwing it in there. Right, right. right. But so, I mean, nobody's doing this in the sense that I think what they're doing is they're taking strains that traditionally have particular effects. You guys have identified terpene, specific terpene pro, uh, profiles and are putting them in products that are named things like sleep, calm, relief. What are some of the other popular strains that you guys have worked with? I know you said Jack Herrera for Bliss. Yeah. Are there some others you can name with the Yeah, so well I could well I can give you what the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the kind of yeah, family. Yeah, I would imagine of, like of, sleep is like GDP or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, I mean. it's in your GDP type family, right? Arouse is in your Skittles family, mm. right? Um passion is in your super hashy Kush families, right? You're very hashy type type products, but you know, rather than rather than just mimicking an exact strain, you know, we took the we took the range of what are the what are the six or seven most popular strains? Not, not, I guess not even most popular. What are the six or seven evidence based that hey, people love this for sleep, right? People love people love this for for pain relief, right? And taking that and going, okay, let's look at those and analyze the terpenes and let's let's overlay them and see what are the terpenes that are consistent between all of these that are actually making these work. Mm -hmm. Right. And then and then building, you know, using that as the building That's block awesome. for a formula. That's awesome. Now, when you what was the feedback that you were getting when you were testing this? Was is it very consistent or is it like uh wait, like 80% of the people felt this way, or was it all over the place? Yeah, map? so I mean, we when we when we built it, we had a we had a requirement that if we didn't have eighty percent positive feedback, that it couldn't make it to the next level of testing, mm. right? And we were very fortunate to have to have a really good number of groups and some great groups work with us to do this testing. So 
we, you know, we had a group from Sonoma County that was primarily, primarily serves elderly medical patients. So we had hundreds of elderly medical patients that had been consuming cannabis for a number of medical reasons that, that, that gave us amazing feedback on our products. Right. And then we used, um, you know, we have a, a very medicinally focused shop that really, really pushes the pen to their customers because, you know, they're really focusing on medical, medical patients called Cornerstone Collective out here in LA. And, um, and, and now we have, you know, when we do these consumer studies, which we continue to do with products and new products that we're, that we're looking to bring to market. So our, our, so our existing consumer base actually gets to try new products as they're coming out, oh, okay, right? Cool. New blends, new formulations. And really, you know, after the terpene blend was locked, it was a matter of what is the THC and CBD ratio that works the best for each one of these? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because that's, because it, it's very impactful, right? A a nine to one uh, THC to CBD like the Bliss. So if you have a, a product that has 66% THC and 7% CBD in it, you're not going to see that in the plant. Very few plants are going to express that naturally. Right. Um, it's going to feel very different than a THC uh, oil formula that is just 66% THC and 0.2% CBD right. like you yeah. see in most, right? And that it's, it's, it's an entourage effect that has to do with your CB1 and CB2 receptors in your endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about, you know, the difference in the side effects, adding that CBD not only decreases the side effects that you're going to feel, but we feel it also, you know, I just, I feel it number one smooths out the experience so that you don't get, you're not, you're not engaging one of those two receptors too much. Um, but it also elongates the experience, mm. right? So you're getting a little smoother, what I consider to be a smoother experience. Now you accumulated all this knowledge just for after switching from the e-cigarettes. You weren't already reading about all this and learning about this prior to that. Well, I mean, I grew up in I grew up in agriculture, so I knew uh, <laughs> knew a little bit about it. But yeah, mostly it was just, you know, mostly it was just as we were making devices, actually getting down to what, how is this stuff actually made and what are people, what components of this are people actually getting benefit from? And I think that's the most confusing part in cannabis, right? It's like some people like um, indica strains for sleep. Some people just like them because they like to get a body high and hang out on the couch and, mm -hmm. and eat and play video games or whatever, right? But what are the actual components that are making you feel that way? So I guess my, you know, the way I approached it was a little more from that engineering mind, right? Sure. Being, totally. hey, here's, Plus, how you, totally. here's how you build an electronic circuit board. Here's what each one of those components done. And here's why it works when it comes out the well, other end. Well, plus, you know? plus uh, most of the research on cannabis or the good research on cannabinoids and terpene is like the last 15 years, 10, 15 years. So, you know, if you start, this is the time to learn. This is when all the information is coming out. Have they identified, because I know CBD doesn't attach to either the CB1 or CB2 receptor. Have they figured out how it, it, it creates its effects? I know it, I guess it, it improves the way your endocannabinoid system works. Yeah, so it's like a booster function. And this is something that I think is the most, one of the most interesting things about the medical community and cannabis is that now, we, as we sit here now, it's widely accepted that you have an endocannabinoid system in your body and that it engages with the other important systems in your body, neurological, lymphatic, circulatory, right? I mean, the endocannabinoid system is there and it exists. 15 years ago, there wasn't a single medical school that talked about the endocannabinoid system. So how do you have an entire, how do you have an entire important function body functional system that engages with every other part of your body that's not even being that's not even mentioned in a medical textbook mm -hmm. so you, you know that's that's one major reason that there's such a lack of knowledge about how exactly it works it's because doctors don't even know about it right and then if you add on if you layer on the fact that there is the the federal Ill illegality issue um there's no funding for research not only that how did you guys let's get into the business side like did you guys get funding or how did you, are you how many partners are there how did you do that yeah so i mean originally it was self-funded among the partners um from the device side we 
we gave our technology and dosage control patents and the construction of the device and anomaly donated services to build the marketing and build the packaging and do those things. Um, we had we had a great group of, of very early investors. Um, but since then, we've raised additional capital. Uh, most of it's been from a very small group, but we have a, we have a nice core group of investors um, that have, you know, that have allowed us to get to the point that we are right now. Um, moving forward, we'll, you know, we're at the point now where we've gone beyond the proof of concept for this device. People really enjoy it. And we could have taken this product and gone from state to state to state already. But the I think the most important thing to us as a business was to know exactly what the perfect way to present this product to the consumer was and make sure that enough people had the chance to engage with it that we knew, is there, an, is there changes that need to be made? Are there adjustments to our business model that are going to allow us to reach more people? Um, was there anything you guys had to recalibrate? Was there anything that you guys, after doing all the testing and kind of getting it out there and seeing a great response, did you get rid of a strain or did you, did you do anything like that? Yes. We've had, we've had one, as far as the actual product goes, um, you know, we're continually innovating on the pen side, trying to make everything work better, function better, reduce any failure rates that there are, improve the experience, but there hasn't been anything significant on that side we did we did change the calm formulation from a from a 1 to 15 THC to CBD to a 1 to 10 mm. so we increased the THC a little bit not a significant amount you know i have conversations with people all the time that are scared to try any amount of THC but our calm formula has you know 6% THC in it it's not going to intoxicate you but it's going to give you a significantly better experience than a 99% pure CBD isolate will right? Because of that entourage and, and being able to engage with both receptors. I think that the, I think the most adjustments and changes that we've made have been around education. From the beginning, we were very, very focused on things like the field guide, things like our six-fold brochures that fold out and try to tell you everything we possibly can about the product, because there's a lot of education that comes along with something like this. It's different. It's new. Most people don't understand the cannabis industry anyway, um, and putting something that's completely different than everything else on the market out there, it takes, it takes time to educate. Like you said, nobody else lists the exact terpenes on there. No. That could be confusing, right? So we try to, you know, we try to, we try to educate in a way that makes it incredibly simple. We've focused a lot on building our own owned experience inside of retail stores. So, I believe now in LA, we have four shop and shops. So basically a little Nespresso boutique inside a dispensary mm. that we staff full time. So oh, you walk into oh, a store. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yes, cool. so you walk into a store and there's actually a dosist representative there and little trays of plant material that represent the different terpenes, myrcene, linalool, oh, right. farnesine, things like that. So you can smell it. You can un actually understand the experience that you're getting from this piece of technology, right? Oh, right. You know, so, so most of our learnings and most of our change has come around understanding how we can connect with our core consumer and get them into a dispensary in a way that feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. What states are you guys in? We're just in California. Just in right California. Now. And yeah. how, how would you be able to move in other states? Yeah, it's, it's very different from state to state, right? It is. It is. It's a complex situation. In most states, you need to partner with um, a licensee um, or you need to go get your own license. But most, uh, most of the states aren't like California. Mm -hmm. So California has a lot of licenses, right? There's thousands and thousands of licenses that are granted to companies. Um, you know, you take a state like Illinois, there's only 20 growers and 60 dispensaries. Mm. In a state like New York, there's seven groups that are fully vertically integrated. Florida, 13 groups that are fully vertically integrated. So the newer states, you know, not the non-Washington, Colorado, California, um, they're all much more consolidated so, you know, you just have to choose the right partner. Sure. Um, for us as a business, this isn't a brand that's going to go get licensed. We're not just going to go like, hey, here's here's Dosis. You know, here's the pen, here's the packaging. <laughs> Fill it up, go do your yeah. thing. No, right? you, guys are, you guys are going to dominate California and then when it goes national. Yeah. That'll be the next step. Yeah. I mean, we will move. We will be in, um, 
we will be in more states by the end of this year. Um, and then we have a strong focus on Canada. So we've just started our, oh, wow. even though vaporization isn't legal in Canada yet, um, full legalization of cannabis is going to happen probably supposed to be July, probably going to be around September. Um, we've been very engaged in the process there, both in getting vaporization legal first, which just happened with the S5 bill. So there wasn't even e-cigs legal in Canada until, oh, wow. you know, until a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. But then getting what's called the S45 there, which is getting the actual allowance of cannabis vaporization legal there. Um, but we've already started our full marketing campaign there to let people know that dosis is coming, right? And we think those kind of markets where you don't, you haven't had this really long history and thousands and thousands of brands on the shelves, you know, those are the kind of markets that the product is even more attractive in, you know. Uh, uh- Let's talk a little bit about the the types of pens that you guys offer, or, or it, the the different because they're all named different names depending on their effects. We talked about passion for a second. That one's supposed to be for libido, sex. Yeah. So, um, and you guys are saying Kush was in there, which I didn't know that the Kush strains were known for that. Or so are- yeah. So I wouldn't call a. So if we talk about if we talk about both of them in combination as sexual health products, um, the arouse is to use more standard cannabis language, a sativa dominant hybrid. Okay. So it is a inhibition lowering, but not drowsy, something like you're going to feel from a Jack Herrera, that energy, Got it. but a little, a little less energetic and a little more inhibition lowering for me. That's what I use before I go out at night. Okay. Right. If I'm going to, if I'm going to go before to a you party, podcasted? Did you have <laughs> I did not before I podcasted. Maybe I should have um, uh, a little bit later yeah. for the party. Um, but yeah, so, so that's an inhibition lowering product, right? It's about kind of interpersonal connectivity. Okay. Um, the, the passion is more of a body engagement, right? So that's why we say kind of the get in the mood, stay in the mood. Um, your, your heavy cushions and things sure. like that, Indicus. they are really, they're really about your body feeling, right. Connecting with yourself. Um, and whether that's, you know, whether that's personal, just feeling that body high, feeling really engaged with yourself, or that's with your partner, right. Feeling engaged with your partner. So one is much more mental and one is much more physical. Got it. Got it. And then, uh, relief, Calm, sleep, bliss. Let's do those real quick. Uh, what is relief for? And ha- that's obviously a pain relief. And is that the highest? Is that the highest CBD? Yes. Yeah, so it's that. That's our pain relief product. Um, it's a two to one THC to CBD. Okay. So that's so, the closest to being almost an even. Spirit, yeah, it, it, that's the closest to a one to one. I will so like say a that blue it was dream type of strain or something like that in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's actually the most inert of the strain profiles, right? Because um, when it comes to pain relief, just like sleep, I would say, two incredibly complex conditions, right? There's a lot of reasons that people are in pain. Yeah, good point. Um, Is it it muscle soreness? Is it muscle spasticity? Is it inflammation? Is it actually some kind of dysfunction, you you know, within your, you know, the discs in your back or something like that? Or is it just headaches, right? I mean, there's so many... There's so many, there's so many reasons for pain. Um, so the THC and the CBD in combination, even though even though it's a for, it's still a 48 percent THC content in that product, because of the 24 percent CBD, you're going to get a modulation, right? So it's not an intoxicating product. Okay. Personally, that's my favorite of the products. It's not. Um, it's not incapacitating mm-hmm. if you're if you're not really tolerant to THC. Um, to someone like myself, I you know I I use cannabis semi regularly, but I do have a tendency towards anxiety and paranoia if I use the wrong strain or too much. Yeah. Which strain would be the one that I would use, or which one would I would use? Which pen would it be? The relief to stay away from the anxiety. Yeah, just, not that I, I have anxiety, but if I go like too strong on the sativa, it can give me anxiety. Yeah. So I mean, really, we've. Tr- I think part of part of the CBD being in there and part of the way the terpene profiles are built is to decrease those side effects, mm. right? Um, yeah, something like Durban poison is like a, can give people incredible anxiety, yeah. right? I mean, it's the super strong sativa product. Worst so, anxiety I ever got in my life was White Widow. White Widow got, put me in a 
bad state. <laughs> it, was <that> cool. <laughs> it, it, it can happen, right? Yeah. And um, so Bliss is actually the most sativa of the products we have. Okay, but we don't get you know we don't get a lot of feedback around the paranoia. And there, there's a couple there's a couple of things around that. First, the doses aren't incredibly high. Okay, right. So you're not gonna you know after a couple of doses, which is why we recommend especially if you're a new consumer or if you're just consuming a different type of product than you normally do, take a dose, wait 15 minutes, take another one, uh, right? Within that time frame, you're going to know with an inhalable cannabis product how you're really feeling about it. Mm-hmm. Um, sleep's obviously an indica product. Um, the Calm is a hybrid profile, very okay. inert profile, right? Um, same with the Relief. We're really work, we're really letting the THC and CBD ratios do their work okay. in those products. Um, not that the terpenes, so, so in the Relief pen, um, you know, beta carophylline is a great example, right? Old, you know, throughout history, um, you got a toothache, chew on a clove, right? Put it in your mouth, chew on a clove. That's the beta carophylline in that clove oh, actually activating and having anti-inflammatory properties. So you're going to see a lot of beta carophylline in the, in the relief pen on the terpene side. Um, and then arouse the sativa dominant hybrid and passion is our heaviest indica product, yeah. right? Which, if you're which looking, one's your best seller? Uh, bliss. Oh, mm-hmm. bliss. Is. Yeah. So, you know, an interesting thing about bliss, even though, even though everybody looks at it as a medical product and new, new consumer product. This product's actually won High Times Harvest Cup for Best Vaporizer. Oh, wow. So, oh, that's awesome. And that's a panel of, you know, 27 people that have been in the cannabis industry for a really long time. So yeah. that was in November of last year. So, you know, it's not just for, it's not just for the, you know, the soccer mom that or the new That leads me to consumer, the next question right? I wanted to ask you, which is, do you, do you think that you guys are going to just kind of have a, a piece of the pie and there's still going to be a lot of other players in the space that market to like a the more uh, recreational use? Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, that, that's absolutely going to happen, right? I mean, I, there's there's very few markets in consumer packaged goods that are dominated by single brands, you know, save energy drinks with Red Bull and Five Hour Energy mm-hmm. and some other examples. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, and cannabis is a... It, it, not Not everybody reacts exactly the same to cannabis products, right? It's one of those things that you know, two people can have two different experiences with the exact same thing. And everybody's body chemistry is a lot different. We especially see that on the edible side, right? Mm -hmm. One, you can have a, you can have a 120 pound female that can take 25 milligrams edible. And I'm a 210 pound guy. And if I take five milligrams, I'm wiped out. Right. Mm -hmm. And that just has to do with body chemistry. So, so there's a little bit of experimentation that goes on to figure out exactly what's right for you. Right. Right. You know, it's very similar to nutraceuticals and supplements, right? There's, it takes experimentation to know exactly what's right for you. And that only underpins the reason that dose is so important, right? If you're going to experiment, experiment in a way that you know exactly what you're getting. It's controlled. So you can figure out what works for you. Mm hmm. Well, yeah. excellent. You guys are you guys have set the bar very yeah. high. I mean, very very, very much high. Ahead I, of the curve. Or yeah, I'm 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 pretty in the into the the industry just as a as a consumer and also as an observer. And I don't know anybody that's even come close to what you guys are doing. And you guys have answered uh, a lot of the the problems that I have that I saw with the legalization of cannabis, where the industry was going to make it very difficult to to go legal and something like this. Like I I don't know how a regulator, an honest regulator, is going to look at that and say. No, that's not. We can't have this be legal. It's it's, yeah, and that's our hope, right? As as the new states come on, we've been, you know, it's, we've been very active in Canada, and actually, our our Canadian president just spoke in front of Senate, the Canadian Senate, last week, um, in support of in support of the S forty five bill to get vaporization legal faster. There, mm. you know, you've got a you've got a large country, thirty five plus million people that's about to go completely adult use. And the only things that people are going to be able to buy are flour and edible oils, like olive oil, infused olive oil, you know? So getting products like this out there so that more people can consume and you can do it in a more dosable way is really important. And, uh, you know, we think that the platform is really great for that. And if that, you know, we don't expect every person, every new consumer that comes and buys a dosis pen. Yes. I'd love for them to consume dosis forever but it may not be the exact right thing for them long-term. But if it's the reason that somebody takes that leap of faith to get off of Xanax, 
to not take an Ambien at night, to try to cut down on the opioid use, right? If our product is a reason that they do that and then they move on to something else, that's amazing, right? We've done our job. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, but what we found is that people love the product and they know it's consistent and it works regularly for them. So we have a lot of, we, you know, most of our customers are lifetime customers, but you know, the real, the real benefit to the entire industry is that the more people that we can get or the more people that we can give permission to, to try cannabis are only going to continue and enhance their life and try to pull back off of pharmaceuticals and utilize cannabis, you know, clean, consistent, quality, well-made cannabis to make their lives better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for. Delivering health and happiness is our timeline. Well, hey, man, tagline, I, right? so. I'm glad you guys are doing it and you're doing a great job. Yep. Appreciate you Thanks. coming on the show, brother. Yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate the time. So right thank you very great. much. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.